lamentations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I know it may seem a little early, but I've had a Christmas memory come into my head this week. I recall being about six years old, and it's Christmas morning, and it's probably about six in the morning, and I'm ready, because I'm a morning person. I want to get down there and open those presents. And as many of you know who come to perhaps the 11 p.m. service on Christmas Eve, priests don't tend to get home and in bed till about 3 a.m. So my parents were not all that thrilled with the idea of getting up at six on three hours of sleep and opening presents. So my mother, in her infinite wisdom, said, go back to your room and count to a thousand. <laughs> and when you have got to a thousand, come back. I have a feeling in her mind, the hope was that I would get frustrated and give up, that maybe a six-year-old doesn't even know how to count to a thousand, or better yet, I would just fall back to sleep. Of course, as you can probably guess, that did not happen. I'm honest, and I did, in fact, count to a thousand. And then I marched myself right back into the room and said, I have arrived at a thousand. I am ready. And to my mother's credit, down we went. But I bring this up because, again, she had set in her mind a limit, a number you have to reach before anything can happen, in the hope that I might just give up. And I bring this because today Jesus continues his teachings on Forgiveness, topic we spoke about last week. If you may recall, or if you were here, or if you heard the sermon on YouTube, perhaps, Jesus laid out for us a four-point way of dealing with forgiveness. One, you go talk one-on-one, -on -one, bring a couple of other people if it doesn't work, bring them in front of a whole bunch of people, and then you just got to forgive anyway. But today, after hearing that teaching, Peter goes up and says, uh, wait a minute, I... I've got people that just do the same thing over and over again. They never seem to learn. How many times? Because, um, you know, I'm, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, now we've had it. Or three strikes, you're out. Come on, Jesus, you know this stuff. There's got to be a limit to how many times. I've got an idea. Let's take a biblical number. Let's go with seven. Seven's good, seven days of creation. How about seven times forgiveness? But once we've established that this person's never going to change, we can no longer have to deal with them. And of course, Jesus says, eh, no, seven, no, not quite. Try 77. And of course, in Luke, he says, try 70 times seven. The number gets big because what Jesus is, of course, saying to Peter is, you don't get to stop forgiving. And as a matter of fact, if you're worried about how many times I have to do it, my guess is you're not quite getting the point of what forgiveness is supposed to be about. You're into your checklist mode. And that's not how God operates. He gives, then he goes on to give a parable, of course, of one of a slave who owes 10,000 denarius compared to his fellow slave who owes 100. God clearly being the master who forgives all the debt, says, you asked for it, I forgive you. An amazing piece of grace given to somebody who the first initial response from the master was, you're going to jail until you can pay. Have you ever wondered how somebody who's in jail is supposed to make any money to be able to do this? It crossed my mind, but I said, that's not the point of the parable now, is it? And then, of course, he's been forgiven, he's forgiven this amazing moment of grace in his life. Something that should have changed his attitude, his behavior towards others. And he goes out and encounters somebody who owes him basically chump change. And has at it. Says, you're going to pay now. And, of course, the guy also pleads for the same mercy. And this guy, it didn't quite register with how he had been treated. And throws the guy into jail. Master finds out about it and says, what part of being forgiven did you not get? What part of this amazing grace that I have bestowed upon you were you not willing to share with others? And this is, of course, he's bringing a parallel to how God has interacted with us in our lives. My sense is that forgiveness becomes easier when you have actually experienced forgiveness. What we choose to do or say towards other people from a faith perspective often mirrors how we believe God has acted with us. I, for one, have experienced grace pretty much almost daily. 
And I try, and not always successful with this, but I try to extend that same grace. Every Sunday, do we not, in fact, pray, forgive us our trespasses as we have been forgiven? Now, if you've never experienced forgiveness, if you've never experienced God's grace in your life, I'm sad for you. But maybe I can understand why your attitude also makes me believe that that's probably regrettably true. But that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that we have been given grace undeserved because we've asked for that mercy. We've asked for that forgiveness, and it's been given. But the presumption is that we would go forward and do likewise. In the end, an even more important phrase from Jesus, that if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart, you haven't really forgiven. You may have gone through the motions. The words may have passed by your lips. You may have done because Father Zelian the sermon said I had to. But ultimately, if your heart is not in it, the, uh, the aspect that forgiveness is supposed to have on you probably isn't going to happen either. If it's just a motion you've gone through with no sense of depth behind it. As I said last week, the person you're attempting to forgive may or may not care, but forgiveness is about you. Forgiveness is how you choose to operate in relationship to other people. How you choose to live into the ministry that the Catechism says we are all called to. Reconciliation to God and to each other. And presenting that message consistently. When we do give a heartfelt forgiveness, I think it can change our own attitude towards whatever the situation may be. But when we do anything in life that it just feels like it's going through the motions, saying the words because we think that's what somebody wants to hear, it's not real forgiveness. And I don't think we can actually change ourselves, and we can't be released from the bondage of that hurt that is binding us so tightly that can't bring us to that place. So I understand some people took what I said last week to heart. Maybe you went and tried some reconciliation. Maybe you went and prayed about it and said, no, I think he's still wrong. I like the seven times better. But I hope what you might consider is that forgiveness and accepting God's grace is a daily occurrence. It's not something that you will ever be able to exhaust. And in trying to keep score, and to count, have I finally done enough times? It's not like doing jumping jacks and hoping to get results. Because it's not about a physical change. It's about a spiritual and emotional change that can make your life, I think, easier, happier, and perhaps maybe even change that poor soul that hurt you in the first place. But when we forgive because God's forgiven us, we are at least beginning to show that the message of Jesus Christ has taken some root in our lives. Amen.